Hello, my name is Dewey Blevins. Welcome to Mysteries and Histories. Uh, in this episode here, what we're going to do, this is part one of holding the evidence that we're going to call. Uh, I know I've been making videos for the past week or so. It's because of, you know, I've been going through a lot here lately. Uh, my wife and my anniversary was on Saturday. Then my nephew passed away on Sunday. And my wife, she went through surgery. She had a hysterectomy on Monday. So, you know, there's just been a lot going on here. But we're trying to get everything back on track now. Everything's okay now. Everything's been taken care of and everything else. And for the past few days, I've really been thinking about this. You know, when people claim there was a conspiracy and a JFK assassination, you know, I believe in, they should show, okay, they should show the evidence to prove there was a conspiracy in the JFK assassination. Also, as I point out in my research and when I, you know, do my videos and everything else, that if you have evidence to show, you should just go ahead and show it because, you know, as each day goes by, you know, it takes, you know, more, it brings more controversy into the JFK assassination. That gives people more time to come up with more new stories to tell and everything else, which adds on to of this case never going to be solved. And as you know, I'll point out, I've been in this doing this research on the JFK assassination for 13 years now. And within that time, I have uncovered a lot of evidence. And I hold this evidence, and I hold this evidence dearly. Because the pure simple fact is this. There's a lot of people out there so you know, the headshot came from here, the headshot came from there. We go through this all the time. But when you start piecing all this together, and you start, you know, actually finding out where those shots came from, where the fatal headshot came from, where the shot Governor Conley came from and stuff, and pinpointing location where these shots came from and pinpointing location of actual other gunmen there that day. Okay, I had this evidence in my possession for quite a few years now, 13 years. And, but the evidence, like I said, has always been out in front of public's eye. It's just no one's never bothered looking for it. And when I look at this and it's like, you know, there is a lot of evidence here. And then when you start looking and you start piecing together, you start putting it together, you're like, wait a minute, how can ever, anybody ever overlook this? Okay, just like uh, the gunman inside of shelter number three. For a lot of years, we all been told these stories about a gunman behind the picket fence. But like I pointed out, it's only a story. You know, where's the evidence at? Okay, if you're going to prove, if you're going to sit there and make claims of saying there was a conspiracy, make claims that there was a gunman behind the picket fence, show some evidence. That's all I've ever asked. You know. Even when I started this, I was like, where's the evidence at? You know, I'm reading this, reading that, or saying this, or saying that. But where's the evidence? That's what we need is the evidence. Because when you go into a court of law and you're going to hold a trial, okay, if you sit on the stand and they say, well, tell us what you saw, okay, you got this person saying this, and then you got another eyewitness that's saying this, you know what I'm saying? And they say, the way they're, you know, they're lying about it, you know. So this is going to throw out, you know, throw that out of the case. This is why the case was never reopened. You know, people wonder why this case was really never reopened. Because no one's really, really did a thorough investigation into this case. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some of this evidence, okay. Now, I know people can argue with me. And I know people sit there and deny this and deny that. But it's the facts, okay. Now, I know people get on me when they say, oh, I said, this is the facts. And this is the evidence right here, which we can see with our own eyes. Remember, none of us is born. I mean, some of us is born. A lot of us wasn't there when the assassination took place. The only thing we have to rely on is the films and images that was taken that day. So we can actually see what really occurred that day. And with all these cameras and with all these images out there, okay, Someone had to capture something. And as I point out in my research, a lot of people capture a lot of stuff. And when you take this evidence and you look at this evidence, and then when you piece all this evidence together, and when you, as you see it, it all matches in, 
you're like, okay, here is your evidence. It's always been there. Okay, first, like, like, so let's go into it. We have the Mary Mormon photo, which shows two gunmen inside of shelter number three. Okay, we have the Orville Nix film, which is, let me just pull up this individual frame. We have the Orville Nix film that shows a shot being fired from this window here, which I'm going to pull this up as well. Okay, let's pull up uh, this one right here from the Mormon photo. And let's pull up the two frames from the Orville Nix film, which is this one here and this one here. Okay, and let's bring back up the Mormon photo. Now, I want to show you something, and this is what I keep on trying to tell people. It's called piecing it together. It's called, you know, showing, okay, and how these films and these images back up one another. And they really do. They back up one another, okay? Now, let's look at this. We have the two gunmen inside of shelter number three. As you notice, that this gunman here, which took the fatal headshot shot to JFK, his rifle sticking out of the third window up. So we got one window here, one window here, one window here. So it's the third window up. We got one window here, one window here, one window here. Third window up. So we have the hands and rifle sticking out of the third window from the bottom up. We have the shot being fired from the third window uh, up from the shelter. That so basically. The Mormon photo is backing up what we see in an Orville Nix film, and the Orville Nix film is backing up what we see in the uh, Mary Mormon photo. We have the second gunman right here on the side of the shelter, and also in the Orville Nix film, we see a gunman firing his rifle from that same location. Okay, so we have the Mary Mormon photo backing up the Orville Nix film, the Orville Nix film is backing up the uh, Mary Mormon photo. But we don't, we don't stop there, we don't stop there. That's what I'm saying. Now we have the Bronson film, which we can see a shot. If you watch my cursor, this is a shot being fired from the shelter. Okay, now remember, this is filmed in a different location. We have the shot fired here, and we have the smoke trail here. Which what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that motion, which I'm gonna show you right here. Okay, we got the shot fired there, smoke trail. Shot fired, smoke trail. Shot fired, smoke trail. So you see, now the Bronson film is back up the Orville Nix film, and the Orville Nix film is back up the Mormon photo. They're all, you know, adding up, and they're all showing this. They're back one another up. Just like when I show a frame from the Darnell film, which shows the side view of the shelter. And again, both gunmen can be seen. And this time, the gunman is aiming his rifle. So at this point, when I, when I sit there and I point this out to people, you know, you have one film backs up another film. Another film backs up the other two films. You have an image that backs this up and stuff. And then we go on and on and on. Okay, just like I said, it's all about piecing it together. After we piece these information, just like we go into Sapruder film. Okay, in the Sapruder film, we have the fatal headshot of GFK, which everybody knows about that, which is uh, right here. We have the fatal headshot. So when we're looking at the Orville Nix film, <clears throat> okay, we're getting this side view. We're getting the left side view. When we look at the Sapruder film, we're getting the right side view. Okay, so when you line these up, you see the fatal headshot being fired from the window of the shelter. And you see in the Sapruder film on the right side where that bullet's making contact with. So see, that's what we're doing. We're getting a 360 now of what really took place that day. Same thing as in the... Uh, Frame number 330 of the Sapruder film, which I'll bring, let's see, it'll be right here. Okay. Again, frame 40 of the next film right here. We'll bring up this frame here. We'll bring up this frame here. Okay. Again, the oral next film. Sorry, it's not like somebody knocked my doorbell buzzing. The Orville Nix film shows us a shot being fired from the side of the shelter. We can see the shot is aimed towards Governor Conley. So we line this frame up with the Spruder film, and we find out that frame 40 of the Orville Nix film lines up with frame 330 of the Spruder film. And what do we see when we look at the Spruder film? 
Okay, this is what we see. We see the bullet impact into back of Governor Conley's back as he's turning off to his left. Remember, Governor Conley said he only heard two shots. He was hit by the second shot, but he wasn't hit by the second shot until he was turning off to his left, which we can see this in a Spruder film. So his story that he's telling, we can see in a Spruder film. And we can see the bullet impact into back of Governor Conley's back. As I pointed out. So you see what I'm saying. You have the overall next film. Lining up with the Spruder film now. When you line them all up. Just like when I point out to people. About when you look. At the Spruder film. Okay we're going to look at the Spruder film for a moment. Everybody says when JFK was shot. Okay he went back. And then he went to the left. But as I point out in the frames. As you see here in the study here. And we're measuring from. As you see right here, which I'll zoom in, when you measure from this point here, you see where my cursor is, where the back of the seat is and, Gover and JFK's back. Excuse me, when he even was shot. As you see, there's the same distance in between each one of these frames. So when JFK was shot in the right side of the head, he wasn't going back and left, he was actually going to the left. But the only reason why he didn't go all the way to the left at that point is because Mrs. Kennedy had one arm here and one arm here, and she's taking an impact. Then I also point out in the Spruder film, that when we watch the Spruder film, there's a lot of clear frames to it. But when the shot in frame 313 occurs, which is the fatal headshot JFK, the film starts getting blurry. Then it starts clearing up again. And then when the frame shot again in frame 330 of the Spruder film, because we can know this by the uh, oral next film, the frames start getting blurry again. So there was something that startled him. But the reason why, as I pointed out and I showed people, the reason why he didn't get startled as much as it is, because also in the Orville Nicks film, we could see Mrs. Setsman bringing up her arms and covering over Mr. Spruder's ears, which I'm about to show you right now. I have it in here. I think I have it in here. Okay, that's Bronson film. At least I thought I brought it in here. Okay, I don't have it on me, which I thought I did. I thought I did have it. Let me see what's in this one here. Nope, that's the second video. Give you a little insight on that second video we're going to be making. But anyway, we can see Mrs. Setsman bringing up her hands and cover over Mr. Sapruder's ears. Okay, just like when I sit there and I point out the fact, well, let's look at this right here. What is this guy looking at? He jumps up, both of them hit the ground, he jumps up and he starts looking in that direction there. What is he looking at? Well, even when I was in Dallas, I went ahead and uh, went to that location. Okay, went to that location. And here's what he was looking at, shelter number three. So everything that we're seeing in films and images are pinpointing to shelter number three. Because the films and images show us where their shots came from, where the gunman was located at. And everything else because we can see him hold the rifles and stuff. So even when I was there, okay, people says, well, how did, because you can see right here, an image of me right here, but you see me inside of shelter number three. And people sit there and says, well, you know, you got the gunman taking a shot out of this window here. Okay. And you have the gu other gunman taking a shot from the side here, which I show people those uh, locations as well. And as you see here, remember, like I said, I went ahead. And, uh, Wait, what you call Turn around. Turn this kick down yeah. here a little bit. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to freeze it. Okay. We're going to freeze it there. Okay. We're going to freeze it there. Okay. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look. Now we're doing the 360. And you're going to see the view. Okay. You get to see the view now of what the gunman's view had, what he had when he took that fatal headshot to JFK. Now remember, as I point out, if you look right here, here's where Mr. Sapruder, Mr. Sessman was standing. JFK was shot in this location right here, which is going to throw him off to the left, as you know. Get shot here, it's going to be thrown off to the left, because he was shot right on this location right over here. Okay, you got Mr. Sessman and Mr. Sapruder standing here. So JFK was being shot right here, being pushed off to the left. And as you see, the view they had.
this gunman had to view. And as I pointed out, JFK was shot over here. Governor Cameron was shot over here also. So see, everything that I present, uh, the two gunmen inside shelter number three, just like I could go ahead and I give you, they said, well, how can this gunman be this tall stuff and take aim? As you see, this is how they did it. Okay. Remember, there was three trans picked up that day, but we're going to go into that in a minute. But as you see right here, this is how the gunman took his aim out of this window here and took his shot. I even gave you a second view as well. He could have done it this way as well, which he could have been all more, you know, more locked in, more secured and stuff as well. So see, we look at every different angle. Okay, we do. We look at every different angle. And I present this. Then after finding the location, even when you look at the location itself. Okay, here's the location. Okay, remember, Mr. Sprude, if you watch my cursor, which I'm moving over here, Mr. Sprude and Mr. Sessman stand right here. We have a gunman right here firing out of this location right here. He takes a shot going this way. Okay, what's it going to do? It's going to push JFK to the left. Am I correct? Also, as you notice, that the gunman is on the right side of JFK's limbo where JFK was sitting at. So when he takes a shot from here, going in this direction, it's going to push JFK to the left. It's going to push him to the left, as we see in the Spruder film. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what I'm talking about. Everything that I found, everything I put together, just like when I sit there, when I went to Dallas also, I showed people that the X is not here. The fatal headshot did not occur in this location here. It actually occurred up here. Okay, and this is based off the Sapruder film. And other films as well. Don't get me wrong. There's other films as well. Pinpoints this the location where the fatal headshot occurred. Not here. Okay. So see, I'm putting all this together. And I'm presenting all this as evidence where the two shots to JFK, which is the fatal headshot, and the shot to Governor Connolly. I'm not only telling you where these gunmen's location was and showing you their shot. I mean, telling you about their shots. Not, I'm showing you it. Because now we get to view it. Just like I said. We had the gunman's view when he took that fatal headshot JFK. What's it going to do? It's going to push him off to the left from this angle here. As I point out, now, also this information by these films and images also IDs these two gunmen as well. Let me show you something here. Everybody knows about the image of the tramps. Okay. Which is right here. Okay. Now, when I pointed out that, hey, the tramps, I mean, when you study the film, you study the image, which I'll bring this up here. Okay, here's the tramps left lapel. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. And we're going to shrink this so you can see the whole thing. As I pointed out, okay, we have the gunman on the side of the shelter. Find his rifle from his left side. Aiming his rifle from his left side. This tramp here has a butt plate imprint of a rifle on his left lapel, which is on his left side. So we got this gunman here firing from his left, this tramp here with a butt plate imprint from a rifle on his left lapel. Not only does this match what we see in the films and images, but even the profiles of both of the tramps, this tramp, tall tramps, profile fits the gunman inside of shelter number three. This profile of this tramp here fits the gunman on the side of the shelter, number three. Okay, so now their profiles fit. Uh, more evidence, like I said, it's called compelling evidence. We have this tramp here, which is the, you know, the short tramp. Okay, which I'm going to pull this one up. And we're going to pull this one up here. So you can see everything that I'm talking about and presenting here. Okay. We'll go ahead and shrink this down a little bit. Okay. Bring this up. We'll click on this. Bring this up. Bring this over. Now, as you see here, like I said, we call presenting evidence. We have a gunman on side of the shelter number three, which could be seen as prude film, oral next film, and everything else. We see him taking his shots from that location. We see him shooting from his left side. We see him aiming his rifle in a Darnell film, which is a side view, aiming his rifle from his left side. A tramp with a butt plate imprint of a rifle 
on his left lapel. Then we have that same person also lining up with the hairline receding back, hair coming up forward here and stuff like that. The profile fits, aiming his rifle, firing his rifle on, from his left side, a gun plate imprint uh, from the butt of the rifle on the left side of this tramp here. This profile, this tramp fits this tramp. I mean, this gum in here. So you see, everything fits. See, no one, people sit there talk about these tramps being in assassination. But they claim they was behind a picket fence. When it wasn't behind a picket fence, it was inside of shelter number three. But there's still nothing to tie these two tramps to the assassination of JFK. But there was evidence to prove that these two gunmen, these two tramps, were to the assassins. It's been in front of public side. All they had to do is look at the Nix film, the Darnell film, the Mary Mormon photo, and examine him and piece that stuff together. And then you put this tramp here, and you see he's got a butt plate imprint of a rifle on his left lapel. You see the gunman aiming his rifle, firing his rifle from his left side, and you can see the profile of the gunman. His hairline stuff is the same as exact as you see in the tramps. So see, all that evidence has been in front of public side for, like I said, over 50 years. But it was overlooked. Okay, because people don't want to look at the films, don't want to look at the images, they're worried about the stories told, just like I tell people here. Not only does the evidence, photographic evidence, and research, and investigation all matches and stuff, but we have also eyewitness accounts. As you see right here, we have Bill Newman claiming shots came from directly behind him. What's directly behind him? Shelter number three. Mr. Spruner, his first testimonies and stuff, he kept on, even on live TV, he says, the assassin was right behind them. Again, this is proven when we take their testimonies now, we place all this evidence, excuse me, into its location. We have the two gunmen here. We got a gunman here and a gunman right here. We have the new ones right here. We have Mr. Sprude right here. What's behind him? Shelter number three. We have the photographic evidence and stuff. Where are the shots being fired from here and here? And the bullets making contact right here. So we're looking at all different angles now. And he got the view of what the gunman had when he took the fatal headshot JFK. So see, it's no longer a theory. A theory is a story. A theory is, you know, a story, you know, told by somebody. You know, this could happen or that could have happened. But you got to have the evidence. Okay, just like when they show this, this is one part of their evidence. But see, they're overlooking some facts here. When you piece this together, you say, well, here's smoke trail here. Here's some smoke here. Look at where this smoke is. Here we have the Newmans right here. It's not coming from the picket fence. It's over top of the Newmans because here's the Newmans. Here's Gail Newman laying right here where you can see her. The Newmans are laying on the ground right here. Smoke is right above their head. Okay, so when we put the Newmans back in their location, we put that smoke trail back in its location, we see it's right above their heads, which will be this location here, as you see right here. This is where that smoke trail was. Where's that smoke trail coming from? Shelter number three, which is right here. You see what I'm saying? So you see every piece of evidence that you see here, and this is just a little bit of it, but every piece of this evidence here lines up with one another. The stories line up with what we see in the films and images. The gunman's location lines up. We can see the gunman taking the shots and aiming her rifles from this location. We hear the stories by eyewitnesses. It's all matching in this one location. Okay, everything that you're going to view one way or another matches to this location. This is why I say holding the evidence. Because there's too much evidence here. Okay, just like this evidence here. Proves there was conspiracy. Proves there was other gunmen there. Proves there was other shots being fired there from different locations. You see what I'm saying? Now, when you take something like this to court... And you present this to the courts and say, hey, there was a government inside shelter number three. The prosecutor comes along and says, well, how can you be so sure of this? How can you be so sure of that? Because, you know, this story is told that there was somebody behind. Well, let me tell you something. The Mormon photo shows us this. The Mormon photo shows us two government inside shelter number three with rifles in their hands. We have the Orville Nix film that shows two shots being fired from the shelter number three in the same locations where these gunmen are seen with the rifles in their hands. Okay. We have the uh, Bronson film showing two more shots being fired. I mean, two shots being fired from that location. We go to that location. We see this is how the gunman was standing and stuff like that. We have the gunman's view. We know the testimonies by the eyewitness accounts and stuff like that. All this is coming on site. 
GFK was a shot in the right side of the head. This can be proven by the Sapruder film. This can be proven by the autopsy images. He was shot in the right side of the head, and he was being pushed off to his left. Okay? This is what we could prove where the shots came from. So, yes, it was a conspiracy because we could see this going on now. We could see JFK being shot in the side of the head. We could see JFK, the location where the gunman was taking their shots to JFK for that fatal headshot. We could see the location of the gunman taking a shot to Governor Conley as he was turning off to his left and bullet striking him back because we could see the bullet impact in the back of Governor Conley. Okay, the stories are matching, the films are matching, the images are matching. Okay, everything is matching. Eyewitness accounts, testimonies are matching. Okay, everything is presented right here. Matches, and they all back up one another. Okay, this is called evidence. Okay, and you can't dispute what you can see. Okay, you cannot dispute what can be seen. You can dispute on a story, you can dispute on a theory. But the Mormon photo shows us the two gunmen's location. With because they show the two gunmen hold rifles. The next film, Bronson film, Darnell film, okay, shows two shots being fired from that shelter. And gunmen aiming the rifles and everything else. Okay. It's just piecing all the information together. That's all you have. That's all they had to do. The evidence has always been in front of the public's eye. All they had to do is just piece this evidence together. But I spent 13 years, 13 years, analyzing, taking each piece of this evidence, putting it aside, putting it in a separate file, putting this in a separate file, putting this in a separate file, and then start piecing it all together like a big puzzle to unravel what really took place that day. Like I said, here's one video. This is called Holding the Evidence Part 1. I'm going to make another video here in a minute for part two, which I'm going to show more evidence, more photographic evidence, and more, as like I said, that's all it is. That's all my research is based on photographic evidence, and I present this. In the description down below, you find a site where you can own my book, Evidence Conspiracy, the only book you need in GFK assassination. Don't forget the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to tell your friends about it. Share this information, other information with your friends, family, relatives, on social medias and stuff. Let everybody know this information and even from my other videos. Thank you and you have a pleasant, pleasant day.